Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the element fluorine. The previous video was neon, explained in under 11 minutes. If you want to watch that video, the link is in the description below. Today we're going to talk about the element fluorine. It's a very special element and it has various uses and applications. We're going to talk about its history, its properties, its applications, its purpose, its use, its dangers, and what it's used for in everyday life. So today we're going to talk about Fluorine. Let's continue. So fluorine, an element that's not radioactive but is very reactive with almost every element on Earth, if not on the periodic table. As we can see here, we're going to take a look at its outer valence electrons, which is what essentially matters when it comes to determining the properties of an element and its properties with other elements around it. So let's take a look at how many valence electrons fluorine has. We determined that neon has 10 protons, 10 neutrons, and 10 electrons. Since we know the rules of electrons are that the first electrons in the first shell have two one, two electrons and no more than two. And the consecutive ones have around eight on average uh, for a full valence shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. As we can see, fluorine has seven valence electrons and it usually wants eight. Every atom wants eight valence electrons since it needs one more since it needs one more valence electron, it's going to be very desperate to get it from its environment. And fluorine is not found on its own in the environment because it's so reactive with everything else. It takes the electrons from the surrounding environment if it sees sodium. Sodium has one valence electron, so it takes it right away. Sodium wants to give it, so it gives it up. So let's draw a hypothetical electron right here. If fluorine had all of its electrons, it wouldn't need to react so violently with its environment, and it would be very satisfied, which is why fluorine naturally is found in rocks and in other elements because it's not found naturally in its natural state. So here is an example. This is polytetrafluoroethylene, and this is an example of fusion between carbon and fluorine. Carbon forms bonds with almost anything, so it makes sense that it would eventually form it with the most reactive element on the periodic table. There's way more examples than this. This is just an uh, introduction to how fluorine bonds and why it's so reactive in the first place. It's a yellowish gas. This is how it looks like if you were to be able to contain it in a glass container. By the way, don't put fluorine in a glass container, especially if it's high hydrofluoric acid because it will eat through glass. In fact, people use fluorine to etch out silicon wafers and silicon chips. For example, this computer that I'm going to use to edit this video will use a silicon chip that would be etched by previous hydrofluoric acid in the silicon itself because silicon is made out of silicon dioxide, which is just the elements silicon and oxygen fused together in a crystalline matter that was previously made from adding a lot of heat to sand in the ocean with silicon dioxide. We heat up the silicon dioxide, we make it into a glass, and then the glass gets attacked by the hydrofluoric acid, which contains a combination of hydrogen and fluorine. Since hydrogen does not stick very well to other elements and it's easy to remove, it's basically just the proton along for the ride. The proton just adds the electron for the fluorine, and once the fluorine is dissipated and separates from the hydrogen, it's able to once again express its desire for that one low valence electron and it looks for it in its environment and if it's interacting with silicon dioxide it's gonna see that the oxygen and the silicon have a lot of electrons that it could donate if it were to separate so that's exactly what the hydrofluoric acid does so it takes let's say this is hydrofluoric acid this is the liquid right here I know it doesn't look like that and let's say we drop a wafer of silicon dioxide this is that so let's say we drop a wafer of silicon dioxide in the hydrofluoric acid, which is containing hydrogen and fluorine in a liquid state. It could be in a gaseous state, but if you mix hydrofluoric acid with water, it becomes aqueous. And it becomes into that state. So AQ. Aqueous. We're not going to go into much detail on the formulas and stuff like that, the balancing of equations. We're just using this for general representations of what the fluorine does and what it is used for in everyday life. So again, the silicon that I'm using in this computer and in this recording device is inside the machine and that's sketched by the hydrofluoric acid. Since hydrofluoric acid can eat through glass, it's used in etching specific wafers and specific little dimensions within the microscopic silicon dioxide and they put it exactly where they want it by covering the parts of the silicon wafer that they don't want to interact with the hydrofluoric acid 
and eventually you get a product that's etched exactly how you want it to look based on dimensions of the silicon chip that you wanted to do and how much processing powers and transistors you wanted them to be in in the first place so flooring used for making transistors go to silicon valley tell them hey i'm a chemist i happen to know flooring did you know that flooring is a useful component for producing the silicon chips that you guys use in everyday life to facilitate your lives and to produce your incomes well do i have a story for you about flooring hydrofluoric acid burns through glass do not put it in glass it will burn because it's silicon dioxide remember that by remembering that flooring is used to make your computers how by burning the chips and making them exactly how the scientists need them to be in order to work and function as computers for everyday life and society. In 1886, Henry Moyson was the first person to be able to isolate fluorine and get it by itself. He did this through a process called electrolysis, mixing hydrogen and fluorine combined with potassium and fluorine and made this into an aqueous solution and he earned the Nobel Prize for being able to get fluorine by itself as an individual element, which was a very hard process process to do because fluorine is very reactive when it's by itself and it reacts with anything on planet earth almost anything on the periodic table in order to gain its electron back and become stable as it wishes because it has nine protons nine neutrons and nine electrons that it needs to be balanced and one more electron would stabilize the atom as a whole and get it to become stable which is why fluorine in its natural state is found as a hybrid of many other specific metals and other elements specifically calcium potassium sodium found in your toothpaste sodium fluoride is found in your toothpaste because it's a hybrid it's a compound of the element sodium the alkaline sodium and fluorine which is the most reactive halogen on the periodic table so fluorine an element named by sir humphrey davy he named it fluorine because it means to flow in latin and in spanish it also means to flow fluid means to flow fluorine f l u o the reason it was given such a name is because it makes metals flow the interpretation to this is that it makes metals dissolve making them liquid which means that they technically flow if they are in a liquid state so another cool fact is that fluorine created the word fluorescence in the fact that a rock containing fluorine it wasn't known that it wasn't the fluorine causing the glow but because of fluorine being in the rock that glowed they called it fluorescence as a result and that's why anything that glows such as things in this image right here are called fluorescent objects because they're emitting light such as the first object that emitted light in a similar way that contained fluorine did and that's where the word fluorescence connects to the word fluorine the element fluorine is so reactive that it actually is able to corrode water copper gold and even steel which is just a combination of carbon and iron so basically iron the journey to attaining fluorine in its pure natural state is not an easy one but it is a long and treacherous one that many people did not survive along the way because fluorine is a very dangerous element when separated and it wasn't until henry here was able to do it that's why he won the nobel prize for it later in 1906 he won the nobel prize because he was able to get fluorine by itself through a successful process that could be replicated again and again at was relatively safe or safer than the processes before so what we're gonna do now is analyze the people before and the people that were trying to get fluorine to become its pure elemental state and we're gonna see their process their progress and their successes slash failures along the way so we're gonna go ahead and move on from fluorine's creators and we're gonna move on back in time Fluorine always fuses to other elements and combines to create compounds. The first person to describe an element that was a compound of fluorine and another element was known as Georges Aricola in the Holy Roman Empire during the Renaissance. He was able to identify the properties of the rock containing fluorine, which will eventually become isolated by other people after him. The next person to interact with fluorine was a English glass worker in 1720, and they were the first person to prepare hydrofluoric acid, a crude sample, although in England it was a success because hydrofluoric acid eventually became useful in creating fluorine as an individual compound. The next person to interact with fluorine and get closer to the separation of it was named Carl Wilhelm Scheele. And he has a quote right here. 
He says, To explain you phenomena, that is my task, and how happy is a scientist when he finds what so diligently sought a pleasure that gladdens the heart. I don't know if he was talking about Florian, but I know he was a very passionate individual that accomplished a lot in his life and wanted to just uncover the secrets of the universe and the earth and everything around him through science and the scientific method, which was more established at that time, post the Renaissance. So what Carl did is take concentrated sulfuric acid and combine it with the previously mentioned calcium difluoride, which is known as fluorspar or fluorite, and calcium difluoride is just one calcium atom and two fluorine atoms, combined with the sulfuric acid, which is just two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of sulfur, and four atoms of oxygen. Combine this together and you get a crude version of hydrofluoric acid, which again is just a fusion of hydrogen and fluorine. The reason this is very essential is because it's getting super close to just pure fluorine because what is hydrogen other than just a proton that has an electron we can consider it just an extra proton an extra addition of a proton to a normally stable atom so this is getting closer and closer to pure fluorine which is why it's important to be able to create hydrofluoric acid again hydrofluoric acid is essential in the creation of pure fluorine because it is almost pure fluorine so as time passes, things get more exciting for the history of fluorine. It's soon becoming the present. As we proceed, we will start to notice that fluorine starts to become more and more identifiable. In fact, this person, Andre Marie Ampere, he was the first person to give fluorine its name. Although he didn't separate it completely, he was able to get it in a pure state of hydrofluoric acid, which means that he created an anhydrous compound of hydrofluoric acid, and he was the one that named fluorine. The process for creating hydrofluoric acid was already there due to the previous people before, but he was the one that stepped it up up a little bit more and created more purified hydrofluoric acid which became the stepping stone for Henry Moyesen to take on the stage and finally liberate fluorine from its atomic bond with hydrogen and that's where we get to today on into the present that's when Henry Moyesen comes in and he prepares the individual element by combining potassium fluoride with hydrofluoric acid. I told you it was going to be important again. This was the thing that everybody was preparing. The hydrofluoric acid was necessary in the separation, the final separation of fluorine. So as we can see here, the hydrofluoric acid is used in the formula to create hydrogen fluoride. Thank you guys so much for watching. That was Fluorine Explained in under 13 minutes or less. If you guys are interested in the upcoming videos, make sure to stay tuned and subscribe to this channel because we will be covering all of the elements in under a certain amount of time.